I'm Doug Newcomb with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and I'm uh, here to uh, talk to you today about processing some NLCD data. Uh, I work in the Raleigh Field Office in, in Raleigh, North Carolina, for the Ecological Services folks, and I've been there for a while, long enough for many people to have heard my name uh, in this state. But in any event, uh, let's go ahead and start with land, National Land Cover Data Set Analysis by Ten and Ted Trollage at Hux for the lower 48 states. Okay, so uh, misunderstanding. I started out, I, right before I went on uh, some leave, I, I thought a group needed NLCD stats for a basin over a period of time uh, and for a species status assessment. That's what SSA stands for. And it turns out they didn't, but you know, I was under the misimpression that they did. And this would have been like the fifth time I've done this in the recent history and I like, I don't want to do this over and over and over again. So why clip it? Why don't you just do it all at one time and be done with it? So down that rabbit hole we go. So NLCD data is a 30 meter resolution integer raster for the lower 48 states. Um, so it comes with 20 land cover classes. We can go to the link there and find out which each class is. And uh, for every layer, uh, which is a year, um, it's a 16 billion pixel raster layer. Uh, eight years in total came with the 2019 release of the NLC data. And you download one great big zip file and then you have eight zero yearly zip files that you have to unzip after that within it. And this is what the uh, 20, 000, uh, 2001 data set looks like. And I'll, oops, let me go back real quick. And uh, for the 2019 release, these were the years that 2001, 4, 6, 8, 11, 13, 16, and 19 were the years that they bundled in there. Now, the thing with the NLCD, every time they do a release, uh, they uh, redo the earlier years because they tweak the analysis method every time they do it. So if you've got a 2011 release with like the 2001 version of that, that will not match up exactly with the 2019 release, the 2001 year. So that's, that you can't compare between releases like that, and that's why they do the processing for all those years every time they do a release. So you're dealing apples to apples on your land cover data. Very smart on their part. So at least when they first released it, it was all in ERDAS Imagine format, uh, which unfortunately does not compress files larger than four gigabytes in size. So when you unzip that file, it was a 26 gigabyte raster layer, an uncompressed raster layer. So to fix that, I convert it to a deflate compressed geotiff and that uh, using the, uh, I use the command line, but you could also do it in the GUI in QGIS. Um, and uh, I just do the good, these are the command line that I do for uh, Good old translate takes about four or five minutes and you go down to one and a half gigabytes per layer instead of 26. All eight years is 12 gig. Huge savings on your hard drives. And it, you know, doesn't make any difference in the data. So, uh, so the hook boundaries. Uh, these are uh, hydrologic unit boundaries that the USGS has delineated. They're nested so that you have multiple hook 12s inside of hook 10s and it's from the Watershed Boundary Database. It's a file geodatabase right now that they have uh, up on uh, the national map. You can download it. And they do cross into Canada and Mexico to uh, complete the basin delineations. And for Eastern North Carolina, this gives you a visual of what the density of the HUC-10 versus the HUC-12 boundaries looks like. And the, the 10 versus 12 refers to the numeric code that designates the uh, watershed. The longer code means it's a smaller watershed. Okay, projection fund. Well, the NHD data is in EPSIG as distributed is in 4269, um, which is not really a, a useful projection for doing any kind of area analysis. Um, the NLCD data came in an ESRI specific custom Albers North America projection. WGS 84 datum, which I had never seen in any USGS <coughs> data set before. <coughs> so it doesn't match any other USGS data. 
but you want all your projections to match before you do any raster analysis. <coughs> so I pulled the NLC data into QGIS and it set the projection environment in QGIS to match the data set. And then I pulled the HUC 10 and 12 data sets in and then reprojected them into geo packages in the same projection as the raster data set I got from, for the NLCD. Just so they all match up. And uh, then I just selected and deleted the HUC polygons that fell outside of the NLCD data set. So uh, for the HUC attributes, uh, HUC 10 is a text field and it has a leading zero for a lot of them. So if you can, I, uh, you, for a raster you need numerics and then a label to, uh, for the, the way I was processing the data in GRASS. So I just converted the HUC 10, uh, I created another attribute called HUC 10 num and, and uh, made it an int, two int function in QGIS and it converted it to an integer. The HUC 12 is uh, larger than two billion. So it doesn't fit in the integer numeric system that GRASS uses for uh, the integer rasters. So I just went with the FID number instead. Uh, just that's the, as a general guideline, you wanna make sure whatever you're using is unique. Um, so whenever you pull data into GRASS, everything has to be in the same projection to do any operation. So I set the uh, GRASS data set to match the projection parameters of the NLCD data. Uh, and then I linked using R external because that just links to the GeoTIFF instead of duplicating the data inside the GRASS workstation. It's a lot faster and it takes less hard drive space. Make your life easier, folks. Uh, and then you set the region of computation inside of GRASS to match the NLCD file so that your cell footprints for uh, inside of the grass, grass uh, workspace are going to exactly match the cell footprint of the NLCD. Anything you create in that workspace at that cell resolution is going to be created at the same cell alignment as the NLCD data, whatever you process. So I imported the HUC10 and HUC12 vectors as polygons and it rebuilds the topology and that's what took an hour for each one of those things nationwide. Um, and I'm just giving you examples here of the, the uh, command lines to do that. You can go through and review the video. I'm just talking so that you'll have plenty of time to pause whenever you look at the video later on if you're interested. Uh, just uh, select the, the, the data layer, vector layer you want and pull it in and it does the import. Uh, but I want everything to be a raster because I'm gonna, the operation I want to do the statistical analysis is a raster operation. So I convert all the vectors to raster. Uh, and as I said before, when I do that conversion, it's going to be the same cell size and alignment at when it's created as the NLCD rasters. So you don't have to do any alignment afterwards. Uh, the more memory for the V to RAS command, the faster it's going to be. The laptop I've got here is 96 gig of RAM. Didn't come that way, but that's what Amazon's for. Uh, and uh, I upgraded it to 96. I only, uh, I used 50 gig of RAM just to make it faster. Uh, it'll, it will do it uh, probably with four gig of RAM, but it would take longer. Not, not a big deal. Uh, Grass has been native 64-bit on Windows, as I say here, since 2016. So you can use uh, most of the operations in Grass, I think all of them these days, you can use all the memory that's available on your uh, computer. And so this is just showing the, the commands, the, the different tabs that I set. I uh, set, sold the source of the raster value as an attribute. I use the numeric as the attribute value to set the value of the raster. And in Grass, you can put a label on that category. Uh, and so I used a, the text field denoting the name of the Huck watershed as that label. Um, so, and then I just give it the amount of mem memory I want it to use and let it go. So I then go to do the analysis using our report in GRASS. The, uh, or you uh, give it raster layers and it will spit out a text file that gives you a report 
on a cell by cell basis, or you can aggregate by acres, kilometers, whichever, or a percentage in this case. So uh, in this case, I, I selected the statistics of uh, square kilometers, cell count, and percentage. Just to, I always put the cell count in there just in case I want to double check my numbers because I'm a suspicious guy. Um, I set the page width uh, a little different than the default because there are very long names in the, some of these watersheds and they'll wrap around inside of grass and when I'm doing the data processing of the output text, I, I don't want to deal with that. So I just make the, the the page width of the output text file larger than 79 characters to account for that. And this is what I get out in our report. It's a fixed width text file report. Uh, you know, it takes, uh, for each year that I ran through, it took about 10 minutes for the Huck 10s, 18 minutes for the Huck 12s. Not much time at all. To, to run through and, and do the raster analysis for the 16 billion cell layers. And then uh, I take a Python script that goes through and reads line by line, picks out the lines that have the, the actual Huck names, and then pulls out all the percentages of each of the land cover classes. The, I don't have a Python script up here, but the easiest way to do that is you get a list in memory in Python of all of the potential land cover classes and set them all initially to zero. And then as you go through each one of these lists, it, and it finds a class that matches up, it will change to uh, set the percentage to what it is actually in that watershed and leave everything else zero. Makes your life a little easier. And so this is what I get out as uh, the result of running the Python script. You get a comma separated file with the uh, the uh, huck number, the, the uh, name of the huck, and the percentage of each of the components of the land cover for that, that huck. Uh, now, uh, this is just for one year, so I did this for every year, so I had several CSV files, and I was just killing time, so I just uh, pulled the CSV files as delimited text layers into QGIS. Um, and because I, I converted that uh, Huck 10 to a numeric, <laughs> um, I had to go through and create a CSVT file, which is something that it was created specially for Google. And what it does is just a one line file indicating, uh, well, two lines. It indicates what every category is, if it's integer, uh, real, uh, or uh, text and just have to designate that way. So as I was trying to restore the zero in front of the, the uh, Huck 10 numbers that were there. And uh, once I had that done, I just joined attributes by the field value for the Huck. And I just repeatedly do that for each of the years. Uh, with QGIS, when you do operations like the join, you can leave that layer that's created as a memory layer. So you're not actually creating a new data layer on the hard drive, it's just saved in the memory. And that's probably where the 96 gig of RAM helped because by the end of the time, I had eight years of data as memory layers. And then when I got to the final one, I just saved that out as a geo package. And you're, so you just have, don't have any scratch files, you just have the one final layer to do that. And just because I wanted differences. I did uh, use the field calculator inside of QGIS for the attribute tables to do the subtraction of 2019 from 2001 to do a change, which would have been um, would have been better to probably just do it the other way because right now gains are showed as negative numbers. Um, so I also exported once I got everything done. I exported it all to a CSV file because the biologists love to use spreadsheets and. Um, yeah, there's the import, there's the join to the vector layer. And uh, this is what you end up with, basically, is uh, something you can pull up in any GIS that reads a geo package, which is, includes Esri. They've done it for years. And you can pull it up as a, a layer, and you can select whatever attribute you want to display the colors and the text of the values. And. Uh, if you want to export all that out to a CSV file, you just 
file save is, call it CSV and just choose which attributes you want to export. So future work, next product, impervious surface by classes. I'm gonna do uh, statistics by refuge to show changes over time. And uh, we can do catchments. It's a, it's a finer data layer of basins than the Huck-12s. I've not really seen the need yet, but hey, if someone wants to go for it, that's fine. And I can, uh, you can also do buffering around uh, like the single line drainages, and then you could do the same kind of, rasterize that, and you can do the same kind of statistics. So you can get a buffer within an area nationwide for uh, the, the uh, land cover stats around the streams as well. And uh, there is a bug in uh, the window, Windows installer from 7.8.6 on. If you're working in an enterprise environment, it's a very simple permissions fix to get around it. Um, QGIS 3.2.8.4 is the current LTR if you want to use it. And this could be done with a laptop, 32 gig RAM, maybe 16. Doesn't have to be a huge laptop. Just might take a little longer. And I did notice that the speed of geo packages has really gotten better over the years. So if you want this data, you can just go to this URL, our online archive for Fish and Wildlife Service, and just download it. Yours for the asking. And if you have a special projection that you're using for Hux, then all you need to do is download the CSV file and join it. Not a big deal. Um, I think that's it. Questions? I'm I'm done. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh yeah, but you know this is being recorded, <laughs> or you can just email me. I, I put it up on the NCGIS list a couple of weeks back, so you can get it there too. Uh, I don't know. Do they archive that publicly? Do you know, Dan? Oh, uh, do they archive publicly the NCGIS list? I'm sorry? Was the person that didn't want this excited that you did it? Well, it's interesting because I, 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 they said, oh, okay, we'll get to that in a few months. And I said, oh, fine. So I announced it internally in Fish and Wildlife Service and said, yeah, it's right here if you want to get it. And I had like three or four biologists email me back, great, I've been looking for that. <laughs> so people are excited about it inside of Fish and Wildlife Service. It makes their lives easier, which is always a benefit. Especially the, let's dump this to CSV so I can pull it into my spreadsheet, folks. <laughs> yes? I'm sorry? The stats are all, the stats are all built into the attribute table, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've got it both. You've got, there's a geo package with the Huck 10s, a geo package with the Huck 12s, and each one of them has all the attributes with all the years, as well as that last section of attributes that have the change between 2001 and 2019. I thought you, I thought you just had to build the CSV. Oh, no, no. God, this is GIS conference. I wouldn't talk about that. <laughs> got to do GSP, geo package. Yeah, the open standards. Uh, well, you have a couple Well, one of the standard things we're doing that right now in, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, is a species status assessment. Uh, we get, uh, let me say, legally bound by request to look at species to see whether or not they are uh, uh, need protection. And so we have to do an assessment uh, of the population over time. And for aquatic species, uh, land cover change over time is an important part of that assessment. So being able to look back to 2001 and see how a, a watershed has changed that might have either habits, current habitat or potential habitat for a species in it is a component to the assessment of the viability of that species over time. <coughs> hmm. 
not the only consideration, but it is one of the components. I can see you're all enthused about this. <laughs> Are there any other questions? All right. If not, then uh, we'll let it go.